Or now we're going to split Jesus and say he's only talking about his deity and <clears throat> wasn't talking about his humanity there. I hope he'll stick to the same criteria that he's accused me of. He's accused me of splitting Jesus and me of having a schizophrenic Jesus. And yet I would ask him to stick to his own criteria. And in verse 5, was that the whole person speaking still? Was that still the whole, his whole humanity, his whole deity, everything? Or was it just a preexistent divinity? Now we're stripping him of his humanity, which is the very thing he charges me with. Um, he says that we would have to wrestle it with grossly unnatural words in John 17 to come up with the oneness position. Yet he takes 9,000 singular personal pronouns and says, this is really three persons of the God here. But he tells me I'm the one who's applying a grossly unnatural interpretation. Um, he says that Yahweh says that he does not share his glory with none other. He certainly did. And he used a singular personal pronoun when he did it. One person said, I don't share my glory with no one else. But see, in the Old Testament, it's an assumption when you read a singular personal pronoun. And that's just, we assume that that's one person when it's really one being. But then in the New Testament, the criteria shifts. And whenever they use singular personal pronouns, then all of a sudden, hey, we got the Trinity there. But when we apply it to the Old Testament, it don't work. You see, I'm just asking for consistency. And as Mr. White says over and over, inconsistency is a sure sign of a failed argument. Now, he said that in John 1 and 1, and I have more here with John 17, but I want to at least just hit them a little bit real quickly. He said in John, 7, in John 1 and 1 that we have God the Father, God the Son. Did you hear it? Face to face. So in eternity, we, his words, not mine. In eternity, we've got God the Father and God the Son facing each other. Yet we're told you can't divide God. And yet they're facing one another and no one knew a thing about it for 4,000 years. No one knew one thing, but God the Son, God the Father facing each other. I don't know what God the Holy Spirit's doing, but, but he's got the two persons in the Godhead facing each other. He asked in Hebrews uh, chapter 10, who is the me? And then he went on to say, when it says that uh, a body have you prepared for me? He said, who is it? He said, this is the pre-incarnate. Really? Well, then let's keep reading. And in the next verse where it says that he had a God, he says, oh, God. Yet you can read Psalm 22 and 10. And it says that you have been my God. It's a messianical prophecy. And it says you have been my God from my mother's womb. Yet Mr. Mr. White tells us that's pre-incarnate. So it's pre-incarnate. And God, the son had a God in his pre-incarnate condition. It doesn't work. Um, now, let me get very quickly to the, the John 10 and 30. We hear a lot from my honorable opponent, that because he used the plural, I, I and my father are one, and he used the plural verb esmen. And so Mr. White tells us that that's a plurality of persons and, and, and that, that, would, you know, that that would be the normal understanding of a plural verb would be a plural subject. But I hope he applies that in Revelation 21 and 22. Because Revelation 21 and 22 denotes the father and the son, and it uses a singular verb. To describe the father and the son. So if a plural verb applied to the father and the son. Denotes a plurality of persons. I just want him to be consistent. And use the same criteria in Revelation 21 and 22. When it speaks of God and the lamb. And then it says are its temple. And, or is its temple. And it is a singular verb applied to God and the lamb. So I hope you'll deal with that. Now in Isaiah. My opponent brought up Isaiah 9 and 6. Isaiah 9 and 6 is very interesting. Indeed. Isaiah 9 and 6 says that unto us a son is born and a child is given. Then it gives the attributes of the name. And it says, wonderful, counselor, the mighty God, the eternal father. Now, he again derided me on the, on the dividing line and said, well, the, the definite article is not there. I know the definite article is not there, but the construction is definitive. I ask you again, we talk about natural readings. Who would read Isaiah 9 and 6 where it says Jesus is the eternal father, the, the, the mighty God, and say, well, he's second person in the Trinity. Absolutely no one whatsoever. I submit tonight that Trinitarianism is a forced interpretation and a gross misrepresentation of the text. Thank you so much for your time. God bless. Thank you for that, Roger. It's now time for our scheduled break. I'll pass over to uh, Craig Ireland to uh, give you the details. Thank you, Craig. Now, as we said before the break, the uh, two opponents will get one more round of rebuttals, and that is where they speak independently and attack and defend their case from the other party. And then after that, you can imagine it's going to get very interesting 
because our two speakers will get the chance in the cross-examination to address each other directly. That's where my job starts to get hard as well. I can see we're building up quite an interesting clash, and that's what a debate's all about, uh, getting the clash, having the two opinions very clearly defined so that you and I and all of us can see how they're going to interact. So this round of rebuttals is seven minutes per speaker. And I'll invite Dr. James White to speak in his rebuttal for the affirmative side. That's when I can welcome. Seven minutes is a very, very short period of time, except for Mr. Perkins. While I'm up here, then it's a very long period of time, and his seven minutes for me as well. Let's jump immediately into John chapter 17. He accused me of inconsistency. And he said, well, uh, Mr. White, are you going to be consistent? Because in John 17, 5, Jesus said, Father, glorify me together yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Isn't that the whole Jesus speaking? You're inconsistent. One little problem. Um, before the world was, was Jesus incarnate? Is it not our belief that the incarnation took place in time and that the human nature of Jesus was not eternal? So who's the only one who can be speaking this way? A divine person referring to a pre-incarnate time when he and the Father were in relationship with one another. That has not been touched. Have you noticed that, folks? The exegesis of my presentation has not yet been touched. And so I would suggest that if Mr. Perkins thinks that I'm being inconsistent on the basis of John 17, 5, I'm just going to tell him he's dreaming. I'll just allow the Aussies in the audience to figure that one out. <clears throat> Isaiah 44, 24 was cited. One of my favorite texts where, where, where Yahweh alone and by himself creates all things. And yet in the New Testament, the Father is involved in creation. The Son is involved in creation. Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 through 17. All things are created by him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. So what must we do? We must see that the oneness of Isaiah 44, 24 is monotheism. And in light of the New Testament, we recognize the distinction of the persons. That's called the historic Christian doctrine of the Trinity. You don't throw out the one because of your insistence to say that the other involves some form of Unitarianism. We were told that Philippians 2 has nothing to do with an imaginary trinity. We have yet to be given any exegesis of Philippians chapter 2 at all. Nothing. I'm expecting, again, to speak to the Aussies in the audience, uh, Mr. Perkins, to grab his Bible and go, it's just the vibe of the thing. We need exegesis. We need something more than, well, it doesn't have anything to do with the trinity. Okay. I spent five minutes illustrating the fact from the Greek text that this is a pre-incarnate individual speaking of pre-incarnate actions, and we get, well, it has nothing to do with the Trinity. That is not how a debate is to be run. We were asked, well... Dr. White's cutting God into parts. He, he talked about one Yahweh raining fire from another Yahweh. How's that not two Yahwehs? Well, first of all, Yahweh is uh, unlimited and he is omnipresent. And he can take human form without ceasing to be omnipresent. And the fact of the matter is, I was just quoting Genesis 18. Yahweh rained fire and brimstone from Yahweh on Sodom and Gomorrah. The one Yahweh was walking with Abraham. You tell me what's going on there. To say, well, that, that just can't be because it, what, violates my tradition. 